What's up, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Joshua T. Berglin, and welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglin. We are broadcasting right now on the World's Mayor Experience platform that you can find at www.joshuatberglin.com. Thank you so much for being here. This is going to be really, really interesting, especially for me. Like, I got really, really excited when I was introduced to our guests because, you know, being an evangelist for a few years, getting to work in the church, uh, just having lots of disruptions, and I'm not going to go into a lot of commentary on this right now, but there was a lot that I discovered working in ministry that troubled me. And I'm not, again, not going to go into these details, but the more questions I was led to ask, the more I got pushed away. And that was a real struggle for me. And some of the things that I was discovering, even in my own Bible reading, or that was popping up to me or coming to me, led me to ask some really challenging questions, not just to myself, but to God and even my pastors. And anyway, long story short, being told to stay in my lane, being told that, hey, you should probably be focusing on this and not that, that would bother me. Again, not gonna go into detail right now. But our guest today, uh, I gotta tell you, when I saw what he was about, saw his books, started reading a couple of his books, I really said, okay, this is a conversation I get to have. In fact, in the questions that I have for our guest, Mr. Ray Catania, uh, they're profound. This is gonna be really interesting. And regardless of where you're at in your faith walk, your faith journey, whether you're an atheist, a Buddhist, a Muslim, Hindu, or spiritual but not religious, Baptist, Catholic, doesn't matter. You're going to find this broadcast extremely, extremely fascinating. Um, not only are the questions very diverse, uh, diverse, they're mind opening, they're heart opening, and then at the same time, they may disrupt some sensibilities that you may have, because I know that even my own questions were disrupting mine. I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I do. And part of the reason why I'm no longer an evangelist, at least in the church sense, is because I didn't have all the answers. And I was very, very uncomfortable trying to pretend that I did. And and I'm not in the business of wronging or shaming people or trying to even say that someone's right. Because the fact is, the only thing I've ever known to be proven true is what came from within. In other words, I felt led to do something or I felt led not to do something. And when I was obedient to what I was led to do, I saw why. And that brought a level of truth, an absolute truth, if you will. And I don't know many other absolute truths because it seems like every day and every day for the last two years, I've woken up to what I thought was true, not being true. And so this conversation is going to be disruptive or these questions, these answers, and maybe a little bit of a conversation in 21 questions. It's going to be disruptive, but at the same time, I think it's going to be awesome. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest before I bring him on. Ray Catania, M M S C. I don't know what that credential is, forgive me. He's an acclaimed author, a metaphysicist, and a certified coach. He's the visionary behind Limitless Publications, LLC, Limitless Coaching, and scientific spirituality for the modern human. Catania has authored two captivating award-winning books in his Awakened ser Awakening series, The Atheist and the Afterlife, and You Are Still Alive, Now Act Like It. <laughs> that's, that's a good book, both of them are good. In his role as a metaphysicist, he integrates psychological and biological data with quantum physics to research and develop a better understanding of the fundamental nature of consciousness and reality. As a master certified life coach, his profound insights and intuitive abilities have made him a sought after practitioner of transpersonal psychotherapy and teacher of the practical applications of metaph metaphysics. With a thriving private practice, he guides individuals on their transformative journey. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ray Catania to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. In 
And we're back to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited. We have Mr. Ray Catania here today. And as I said in the intro, this is going to be disruptive, but in a good way. I am so excited for these questions. I'm so excited for Ray being here. This is going to be fantastic. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Ray Catania to the show. How are you, sir? Wow. Thank you so much, Joshua. It's a privilege and an honor to be with you today. Thank you for having me. I, I could just tell from our email exchanges that this was going to be special. So I, I'm truly, truly honored and grateful that you're here today. And before we get into the 21 questions, I would love mm -hmm. to know, mm -hmm. what are you grateful for today and why? Well, you know, it's ironic that you say that each morning I wake up and I kind of do what I call an attitude of gratitude. And it's the way I start my day. And I'll, I'll wake up and the first thing I do is look over to my left and I see my wife and I'm grateful for her and the children and the family and extended family and uh, the day. And I'm most honored right now to be here with you and have this opportunity to speak with you. That's excellent gratitude. I love it. I love it when my guests actually give me real gratitude and not say, oh, the weather's great. Like, <laughs> I mean, unless if you survived a winter in Minnesota or somewhere like that, then I can right. understand the being grateful for the sun. But anyway, mm. uh, thank you for that beautiful answer. Are you ready for your 21 questions? I'm ready. You go for it. Excellent. Question number one. Okay. What sparked the flame for your journey into metaphysics and how has that shaped your role as an author and coach? Mm. Okay, so I would say that one, there were several catalysts. Uh, this story is definitely a whole 40 plus years in the making, which is my entire life. Um, but there was, I had an NDE at the age of 20. And even though, um, you know, I rejected that as being real at the time, um, when I'm 20 years old, let me give you a little idea. There's no cell phones yet. We don't have computers. There's no internet. I'm showing my age. Um, so when that happened to me, I had nowhere to take that information, no one to ask, no one to go to. Um, and I remember, you know, telling this to my own mother who was like, that didn't happen. And you know, that's blah, 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 blah. blah. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, um, and I get that, you know, because the NDE occurred on, you know, while she was there. And if I lost, oh, nearly lost one of my kids during that, I would probably go through a phase of denial too. But coming from her, you know, religious background, it also, you know, I don't think it was like allowed, so to speak, you know? So, uh, and, and I tried to express this to a few friends and they told me I was crazy and everybody told me I was crazy. So, you know what I did? I said, you know what, maybe I made this all up. And and, and the way the NDE occurred was there was a fire in my home and um, it was in the kitchen and there was a gas leak out of the stove and I was on the second floor um, and that's where my bedroom was. And so the gas was rising all night, that gas leak, and it was natural gas and it was rising into my bedroom. So I was inhaling it, but I had no idea all night. In the morning, my mom wakes up, turns on the stove, it goes poof, there's a big ball of flames, it catches the wall on fire, there's some smoke. My father, uh, the way I heard the story, my father runs to the rescue with the uh, uh, extinguisher, puts it out. It's not the fire. It's not the smoke. It's the gas. So the, um, they call 911, and I hear the police and the fire trucks outside. And I'm like, wow, I wonder what's going on downstairs. And I try to get up out of the bed. And this is where the problem starts. I feel parts of my body are paralyzed. I can't move them. I can't move my legs. I couldn't move my head. I couldn't yell. Um, my arms kind of worked and th this is where I got lucky because I, what I did was I grabbed the edge of the bed and I started pulling myself to the edge to try to get out of the bed. It was the only way I had. Um, it seemed like forever, no one was coming up for me. So I just would pull and pull and pull until I got to the edge of the bed. And finally I tumbled out and I hit the floor and I hit it face first. And I won't forget that because you know how you hit your face and you expect the pain to kick in. Here's what's strange. There was no pain. And that in that moment, I was no longer in that body. It was almost like I was spared the pain. One second before the pain is about to come, I'm removed from the body. And now I'm above it and I'm in the corner and I'm looking down at my lifeless body. And this, in the moment, 
did not scare me. Um, in fact, it was beautiful. Um, adjacent from me was this beautiful white light shining on me. And I was one with that light. That light was not a light. That light was love, euphoria, peacefulness. Um, it was just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in, in, in my life, so to speak. Um, no pun intended. But um, so in that moment, um, I wanted to proceed to go into the light. And there was a being at the end of the light who said, come into the light, Ray. It's, it's okay to come into the light. I don't know who that was, male, female. You know, it's not like you hear. It's a transmission of information, right? So I'm not using any senses to receive the information. So I can't identify who or what is saying that to me, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I, I want to go into the light and I proceed to go in and I start, I get maybe, I don't know, a quarter of the way and the euphoria increases. And I'm like, this is wonderful. And I want to keep going. And in that moment, my father busts through the front door, the, not the, the door to the room, to the bedroom, picks that in and he scoops me up and he's screaming for the paramedics. And he's like, my son, my son, come help my son. And he's holding me in his arms and he's distraught. And, you know, my father and I did not have that type of relationship. Like he may have hugged me five times and one of them is when I'm dead. We just didn't show emotion. You know, he was a tough guy. It wasn't like that. You know, there was not, that wasn't, you know, permitted. So to see that, to witness that, and that was something I'd always longed for. I asked the being, I said, I can't leave him like that. Can I go back? And I don't know if that's why I was allowed to go back or not, but I did wake up and I was no longer in his arms when I woke up. I was on the living room floor and the paramedics were working on me. And they had all their equipment and whatnot. And the guys are talking back and forth. And they're like, bring up the truck, bring up the truck. And that means ambulance, I guess. And, um, you know, I'm like, guys, guys, I'm fine. I mean, I, I feel better than fine. I feel amazing. Like the euphoria is still kind of with me a little bit, you know. And um, I'm trying to argue with them, telling them I'm, I'm good. And they're like, you're far from good. Okay. You have no idea what just transpired. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Did you see the light? Did you hear the voice? And now they're looking at each other like, mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, I better just shut up right about now. I'm going to go to the wrong hospital where I can't get out. So uh, I know those places. <laughs> I stopped. <laughs> I stopped talking. I let them take me away. I came back the next day and tried to process this, but I had nowhere to go with it. Nowhere to go. So I boxed it up. I made it not real. I said, well, the light was probably the sun shining in through the window. Um, I hallucinated the, the, the voice and the light because I inhaled gas and I boxed it up and I compartmentalized it and I kept it there for many years and I did not go back to that. But in hindsight, to answer your question, that was a major catalyst. I, golly, that is the best in the, I'm going to say uh, out of respect to what you referred it to as NDE, and I'm sure there's a reason for that. Uh, mm -hmm. But oh my gosh, that I that 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 wow, that was neat to hear. Sorry, I mean I know that you're most you know. I'm grateful for it. I'm but, very grateful for it. I mean, I don't know what that energy is either. I, 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 I had one of my own, but it was from an, like an overdose type situation, Okay. but wow, that story, like I resonate with it, even though I haven't necessarily experienced it that way, mm -hmm. that is, and I wonder, I know I'm supposed to be asking the next question right now, but I, I can sincerely wonder yeah. if we have that kind of authority because I'm, I'm now opening my eyes to the potential of us signing soul contracts. In other words, we agree to our assignment. We agree. That means we agree to our trauma. We agree to all the reasons we're here. Mm -hmm. And the reason that makes sense to me is because I do believe that there's a purpose for everything that happens. There's an opportunity. Oh yeah. Like if, if how can, how can my life full of F ups across the board, mm -hmm. full of all the dark evil stuff that was a part of my life for so long and experiencing all the levels of trauma i experienced how is it possible that that can actually turn out to be the very thing that blesses my life the most and and it so it must mean that there's something to the two and i don't have the answers yeah but i wonder like with what you shared 
how much authority do we really have with our contracts, with our soul, with our spirit? Well, you know, I, I, I can't say that I know for sure. Um, but I have, um, I guess my idea is that we are here to experience this, um, suffering like the Buddhist would say, mm. um, it, our goal is to achieve enlightenment, um, even though we're faced with those obstacles. So I think that, you know, the overall concept and our purpose is to reach that enlightened state on earth before we, uh, die. And, and, and I think that that is like the Buddha said, it's, it, that stops the reincarnation. That's when you move on to another realm. Um, it's not the first realm that we go to when we die, but it's another one. And then you don't come back and kind of repeat, you know, it's, uh, somebody made a joke one time compared it to a video game. And I was like, well, I guess, yeah, you, you trying to level up, right. You know, I think everything that we create in society is based upon things that we know internally. And that's why we created it in the first place. So yeah, there are some similarities. It's, uh, we, we have these obstacles and they are definitely blessings and people will say what, you know, ask me what my greatest days are. They're my worst days. My worst days were my greatest days. Those were the days I showed my character. Those were the days I shined. Those were the days I overcame things that other people would not have, you know, looked at and said, oh my God, I can't, you know, believe that you even went through that and made it out the other side. But that's the challenge, right? To get over that hurdle. And then we can look at it in hindsight and say, wow, I learned so much from that experience, right? I didn't take anything away for the things that were given to me easily. Those were given to me easily so you don't learn like, mm. put me in the trenches and you know give me a little suffering and i'm gonna learn and i'm gonna grow <laughs> and the more of that we experience well yeah the, the more we grow and i i think that's part of the process i agree let's go to question two i 20 minute first question <laughs> because i open my mouth no and that's fine I, I kind of I break my own format every once in a while because sometimes I'm just in awe by what my guest says. I'm like, okay, I want to keep this one going. All right, let's go to question two. So good, though. Thank you. That was a great way to start. Your books have been described as a captivate. Oh, I'm sorry. Your books have been described as captivating and award winning because they are. Can you share a moment from your writing that you feel epitomizes awakening? Mm. Wow. Um, hmm. In both books, uh, let me do a quick. Um, I would think that um, I experienced a significant awakening when I was writing the second book and I was coming to what I thought was going to be the end of the book. Um, and I had been working on trying to dismantle my ego you know, that narrator in the, in the brain or the mind that's always talking to us and telling us we're not good enough. And, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And it's there to protect us, but it obviously goes far beyond. And it's always repetitive of all the things that we've gone through, the traumas and the things that people have told us when we were young, the teacher who said, you're never going to amount to anything, right? That sticks with a kid and that doesn't go anywhere. So that becomes the ego later on in life. The first half of our life, Carl Jung says, we're creating this ego. The second half, we're trying to destroy it. So I was in that process and I, I had developed something I call retraining the brain. And I was implementing this on myself for years. And it was every time I thought something in a way I didn't like the way I thought it, I would change it to a positive uh, way of looking at it. And I just kept doing that over and over and over. Now, reframing. Um, yeah. Reframing. Yeah. Quick thoughts though, you know, so it, just like glass half empty, half full, we have so many of those throughout the course of the day True. and you can just change it. You know, like if you say, I don't want to be sick anymore. Right now, what, what are you putting out there? I and sick, right? Mm. The English language is lost. The universe doesn't understand English. We made that up, but it understands the visual, which gets uh, turned into a vibrational frequency. We send that frequency out, we get more sick. But if I say I want to be healthy, now I put out I and health. That's what I'm sending out, and that's what's going to come back. 
So the way we think and the way we speak, our thoughts and our speech patterns determine our lives. And it's that simple, but not simple because you have to do this over and over and over. It's not weeks. It's not months. It takes years. Mm. So to answer your question, I got to a point where um, my go-to in life was always anger because that's what I saw, trauma, (laughs) anger, violence growing up. And I was trying to lose my anger. That was my goal. So I kept reframing. And anytime something, you know, would start to get me going, I would just turn it around to the best of my ability in the moment. Even if I messed up, I would still say, okay, how would I like to do that next time if that occurs? Right. Okay. So I was, um, here was the moment I was driving my car. It was snowing out. I was trying to get from one place to the other. It was, it was going to be a blizzard and it started to come down. I was driving slow. I was trying to be careful. I missed my turn and um, I drove into a deer. And in that moment, what the old Ray would have been furious, right? The old Ray would have got out of the car and yelled at the deer and and who knows what, kick the tires. I don't know. Kick it? Yeah, well, who knows? I don't know, you know, but uh, you get that adrenaline surge, right? When you have an automobile accident, whether it's your fault or not. And I didn't get it. It didn't happen. There was no adrenaline. There was no anger. It was just calm. It was like I didn't hit anything. I felt compassion. I felt bad for the deer. I got out of the car and I tried to lift the deer up. And you know what? She got up and walked away. Like we had a moment where we kind of like were eye to eye. I've never been that close to a deer. And we're eye to eye. And it was like a moment of, I'm sorry. You know, I said, I'm sorry. (laughs) And, And the deer walked away. And and I looked at myself and I was, I was unharmed. The car was annihilated and, you know, I saved a lot of money for this car, but I realized it's just a piece of tin. That's not a thing. That's just a form of transportation. It doesn't mean anything. And so I got myself home and I put the car in a body shop. I didn't even bring it home. And I Ubered to my house and I went to sleep. I didn't lose any sleep. Nothing happened. I woke up the next day. I planned on Ubering to work. And that was that. And my son woke up and he goes, dad, somebody stole your car. Somebody stole your car. And I was like, no, 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 nobody stole it. I don't have to get up yet. Go, go. What happened? Your car's gone. I said, well, I had an accident. What? You had an accident and you didn't call me. Why didn't you call me? And I said, because I didn't want that reaction. And he was like, oh. I said, there's no reason to react. Everything is fine. The car is at the body shop. I'll take a cab to work and everything will be fine. And he's like, who are you? And what have you done with my father? (laughs) And couldn't you have been like that when I was younger? You know, they're in their twenties now, you know, and they're like, would have loved that guy when I was five. Um, So I lost my anger and, and it's not that I don't experience it because I do, but it's very short it's just like there'll be this little bit of a surge, whether it's anxiety or anger or whatnot, and then it just goes away. And that was my awakening. That was my biggest awakening. I felt other people might read the book and say, no, you had bigger awakenings than that one. But for me, that was huge. So I actually rewrote the whole second book and designed it in a way that if you repeat the things that I did, you'll experience what I experienced. That is so good. Wow. Question three. How do you weave together the threads of quantum physics and consciousness in a way that resonates with both skeptics and believers? And I want to, when I say believers here, I'm talking about religious folk because yeah, that's what I mean. Believers, Christians, Baptists, and I'm not, this is not a bashing or anything. It's just, I want to, when I say believers, I want to reference what I mean. So let me ask the question one more time. How do you weave together the threads of quantum physics and consciousness Mm -hmm. in a way that resonates with both skeptics and believers? So, I mean, the, the, the biggest skeptics usually are the religious folks. And unfortunately, and they really, you know, they have the most in their scriptures about these events happening and yet they reject them and that's something i I don't understand but maybe that's not for me to understand um and what i do understand is there's something called quantum entanglement and if you understand quantum entanglement 
it's basically when two particles um, come in contact with one another, um, they entangle, meaning they have certain properties that they leave with one another, and then they separate. And no matter how far those particles go, it, one could be on Jupiter and the other one could be on Earth, and they can communicate. When something happens to one, something happens to the other, and that's called entanglement. Now, this is just done on an energy frequency vibration level. So if these two particles can communicate, you're telling me that my thoughts aren't something that I can give to you and your thoughts are something you can't give to me because when we emit a thought, it's on a frequency. Thoughts are things. And you know, science and spirituality can really come together and really hold hands. They've just got to look for it. And I think quantum entanglement is the epitome of the most easiest way to understand this. Um, if I dial your cell phone from my cell phone, what happens? My phone, and, and I'm simplifying this, goes to your phone's frequency and they match up. And that's how we text each other or we speak when we communicate, right? So why can't I do that with my mind? I know I can do that with my mind. I have done it with my mind and I can give you something with my mind and not, not give it to you verbally and you will get it and you will receive it. You might think it's your own idea, but I actually gave it to you. Now that's, I can't make you go rob a bank for me and bring me money. That's not, it's not mind control here. It's just simply a thought. If I'm feeling emotional inside, but I'm not showing it, you might say, Hey, what's wrong? And yeah. I'd be like, well, what do you mean? You know, and, and because you're, you're reading what's happening inside, uh, on my frequency. And, and when you look at it like that, I think science and, um, and religion really have to take another look at one another because there's so much there, so much common ground. We just got to look for it. Mm, so good. Such a good answer and a very thoughtful answer too. And not offensive because I probably would have answered it in a way that would have offended people. So you did a <laughs> I love, I love that. Question four. In your exploration of the afterlife, mm -hmm. what has been the most profound insight you've uncovered about our existence? Um for me personally, um what I have I would say, I guess, uncovered was something that transpired when i met my my second wife um i had an experience that um was just uh unexplainable at the time and I'll, I'll go through it a little bit so um i waited until i was in my mid-40s i think to date again after i had divorced um i just i guess i felt i wanted to wait until my kids were older i don't know if i did the right thing or not but that's the way i did it so I went online to meet somebody and get serious and I was going through these different websites that they have. And it wasn't like Tinder or anything, you know, I'm not, not to say I've never <laughs> You're looked old at Tinder. Like, I definitely look at Tinder. Harmony and match so, yeah, I was looking for something that was a little more substance, right? So, and what they do to entice you is they give you like um, examples of ladies that are in your area to try to get you to, to join the site. And the third one down on the right, and I'll never forget it, I saw her and I was like, oh my God, I know her. That's my wife. Wow. And I, and I took out my credit card and I immediately joined the site and I sent only one email and that was to her. And I explained this to her and I said, um, you know, it, I actually put the email in the first book. It's a little bit longer, but more or less I said, um, hi, my name's Ray. Uh, you don't know me, but I'm your husband. You're my wife. And if you'll have dinner with me, I'll explain the whole thing. Wow. And she's like, you're absolutely crazy. And I said, yeah, I know. And she said, when do you want to have dinner? And I you're like, my hero. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's so great. And that's a true story. And so we, and we are still married, living here and uh, happily. Um, but here's what happens when I meet her in the very, very beginning days. It's maybe two months into um, dating and we're just starting to get serious. And she says to me, um, as I think any two people would do, she was like, so what are your spiritual or religious beliefs? Mm. And I was like, mm, you know, I don't, I don't know because at that point I, I wasn't, I didn't start this journey yet. And I still had the NDE in the box and I really never thought about it. 
And I said, well, you know, that's, that's been something I've been meaning to get around to doing is really figure that out and look into that. And she says, okay, that's cool. You know? And, um, I, uh, she says, your birthday's coming up. I'm going to buy you something, uh, that's called a spiritual clearing. And I'm like, okay, you mean like a massage? And she's like, no, no, definitely not. And I was like, oh, rats. Um, I, you know, now I don't believe in any, I'm still trying to hold on to my atheistic beliefs at this point. And because it's simpler there, I don't have to acknowledge the things that have transpired, the fact that I've seen energy and all this other stuff. Um, so I'm trying to remain there and she's more or less pulling me out. So we do this spiritual clearing and I was very kind with the woman and you don't have to be there. It was distant. You don't have to be there. She calls me on the phone, tells me what's going to happen. I'm at work and I had worked my way up to a prominent position in the company. And she says, so listen, don't make any appointments today and don't make any life changing decisions for the next 24 to 48 hours. And if you feel weird, call me and let me know. And I said, well, okay, this sounds great. Uh, I said, thank you very much. I was polite. I was, and I, and I hung up the phone. And a couple hours later, she called me back and said, okay, I'm finished. And I, and I said, okay, thank you for your time. I appreciate it, blah, blah, blah. And, phone. and immediately thereafter, not maybe, I would say within an hour or two, I started to feel wobbly. I started to feel like I was off balance all the time. And I started to feel like there were, um, I was being watched. You know, it was a very strange, strange feeling. I was being watched. And I've had this one time before. Um, it was after the NDE that I had this feeling and I kind of had this at bay, or at least I thought I did. And it was coming back and it was really strong. And, um, I was like, I, I it was a Friday and I went home for the day and I said, I had a headache and I'm uh, be back on Monday. And this is the first time this occurrence happens. It's where the first time I've seen energy and I've felt energy, but now this is the first time it actually appears to me in a human, what looks like a human form. And, it, and, it, and it's not with my eyes. Okay. So this is how it works. It's in my third eye. It's like a movie screen opens up. I can close my eyes. A movie screen opens up in my mind on the screen is a man in this case, and he's speaking to me. Okay. So it's a movie, but he's speaking to me. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, I effed up. I made a mistake. You can help her. I cannot. And I was like, what was that? I don't know who the guy is. I don't know what he's talking about. I have no, I, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. And it persists. He does it again. He comes back over and over and over. Friday night, I go to sleep. I was like, okay, I don't know what's happening here, but this is just very weird. I'm, I'm going to go to sleep. I wake up the next morning, Saturday morning, and boom, there he is again, first thing in the morning. And I'm starting to think that I'm losing my mind. Now, my whole life, I was told I was crazy. So that fits right into what everybody's always told me. And he persists all day Saturday. It goes on and on and on. And by Sunday, he was so persistent, this guy, that I couldn't function anymore. I couldn't drive. I couldn't have a conversation. I couldn't do anything. And I was at the counter paying for my stuff. I'm, I can't forget this moment. And the, I don't know what I did or said, but the cashier says, are you okay, sir? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm really not. And I wanted to just cry. And I took my car and I went back to the car and I was like, and I had been through so much to get myself to that point in my life uh, went to rehab and, 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 and got my college degree and worked my way up the ladder and, and, and became a pillar of my community. And, you know, just busted my butt to give my kids everything. I didn't have everything I, I wanted, um, or they wanted or whatever. And, and, and just, I killed myself to, 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 to do everything right. And now I'm losing my mind. And I'm like, could you stop hurting me? And what I didn't realize is this, this was not painful, but in the moment, so I start to make sure I have my will. I make sure I have a DNR. I make sure I have all the paperwork uh, that I already done. And I make sure my brother had it. And he's like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good, man. I, I just, you know, I just want to make sure you have all my papers because I'm, I'm planning for my demise. Now I think I'm schizophrenic. I think I'm seeing things. This is not, this can't be real. I'm losing it. And now I have to tell this woman I love, I just found who's my wife and I, uh, not yet, we're not married, but I know she's going to be. 
And now I have to tell her, you have to find somebody else because I'm clinically insane and you have a right to know. <laughs> now, I've been there. Oh, so <laughs> I, I, I get my courage up to tell her. And now if this isn't crazy enough, like you said, you can't make this stuff up. Um, my wife is a doctor of psychology and neuropsychology, dual degrees, and she is brilliant. And she is in the clinical, medical, psychological field. Okay. I'm going to tell this woman I see people that aren't there. This is going to be great. This is going to be great. <laughs> Honey, how's the salmon? I see dead people. Uh, dessert? Should we get the dessert, mate? So I finally get my courage and I tell her the story. This guy, the movie screen opens up. The guy's saying this. He's a big guy, husky. He's got a beard, mustache, thick black hair. And he says, I effed up. I made a mistake. You can help her. I cannot. And she's like, hmm, that sounds like my dad. And I was like, wait a minute. You told me your dad died. And she's like, yeah, yeah, he's dead. And I said, so you think I'm seeing dead people? And now I'm like, you're crazy. I'm out of here. Check, please. You know, because I don't associate this with a dead person. I think I'm insane, right? She's explaining, you're probably just a medium and you don't know it. And I was like, what's a medium? <clears throat> now all this stuff is opening up, right? And I, I, I just thought you were going to give me a referral to a doctor, check yourself into this hospital and never call me again, have a nice life. But that's not what happened at all. And that's how I know that this is my soulmate. Um, so she's like, listen, let me bring you to a medium. You guys can talk it out. You explain what you see and how you see it and how everything else and get your validation. And that's exactly what we did. And that's how I know. She is, she and I are, are meant to be who we are together forever. <laughs> so gangster to hear someone else talk about this stuff. <laughs> I literally have spent, I'm 45 now and I've finally come to peace and comfortability, even talking to my parents about what I see, because for the longest time I thought I need to be in a psych ward. And right. even though I really don't want to go back. Like I, I feel like, okay, I'm not safe because of what I'm seeing, what I like, I, yeah. I relate to what you just said so much. Uh, and you explained it so beautifully. Thank you for that. Wow. So oh, this is neat. You're already tripping me out. Like, cause I didn't, I mean, I, the, when I come up with the questions, you know, mm -hmm. I, I can assume maybe what the answer will be based on what I know, yeah. but I love it when I get blunt, like just what no okay i wasn't expecting that so very very good question five okay could you give us a sneak peek into the innovative methods you use at limitless publications to bring scientific spirituality to the modern reader um yeah uh i can so there's uh several different techniques that i teach um and and, and um one of the things that um i think uh, aside, the first thing everybody really kind of has to do is really diminish that ego because we all have that um, egoic portion of the mind that is dictating our lives and deciding, you know, for us what we're going to do by telling us what we can and cannot do. And and a lot of people they think that that they and their ego are one in the same, um, and it's and it's not. you the real you is actually connected. It, it, you have to kind of look at the mind and I broke it down into different parts so that people could really understand this. Your ego is subconscious driven, right? So your subconscious mind has all your past experiences. So your ego draws from your past and makes it your present and future because you're basing your decisions on what the ego is telling you to do. So if the voice in your head says, do this and you do it, you're living in the past, you're repeating the same things over and over. So how do you break that cycle? Well, the first thing that you do is you acknowledge it's not real. Everything that's in your subconscious came from someone else because the majority of the information between the ages of two and seven are subconsciously um, in uh, for ingested for lack of a better word in other words when it, when we're between the ages of two and seven our minds are in a theta state and what a theta state is is a brainwave state that a hypnotist would put you in and 80 percent of the day children spend their time there 
So everything that's around them, everything that's being said around them, whether it's being said to them or somebody else, or it's the television in the background, it really doesn't matter what it is. It is being absorbed. And by the time we're seven, this starts to change like pre puberty, this begins to change. And we go into alpha and other, other brain states more often. And as adults, we never hit theta unless we're just going to sleep and we pass through it into delta, right? So you have to meditate to get yourself into theta. That's the only way you're going to get there. Mm. Uh, maybe not the only way, but you know, the most positive way to get there. So, um, so when, when you look at you, the life that you're leading today is based upon many of the principles of the things that you saw before the age of seven. Think about how crazy that is. Your core principles have already been designed before you were 10 years old. And these are the beliefs that you're still going with unless you consciously change them. You have to consciously say, no, that's not right. I want to do it this way. This is what I think is right. I have to override that. And when we start to do that with some of the things that we want to do it, but when you realize how far you can take this, um, you can change your entire life. Okay. And it's not because like our, our parents or our teachers or the people in those times meant to do it. In some cases, maybe they did, but in a lot of cases, they didn't. They were just the subject of their own parents' ego and what they were putting out there during that time. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a quick story of how I know this is factual. Um, when I was about six years old, my parents had friends over the house and everybody was talking and the subject was phobias. And I was under the table just playing with my trucks like a little kid. And I'm, I'm listening to the conversation. And when it gets to my mom, my mom says, I am deathly afraid of heights. Now, I internalized that. I didn't even hear it, but I internalized it. And for my whole life, if everybody said, what are you afraid of? Oh, I'm deathly afraid of heights. I would even say it like her. I would say it the exact same way she would say it. Because if it's bad for mom, it must be bad for me. At the age of 50, we went to Peru, my wife and I, and we wanted to climb to the top of Machu Picchu. It was going to be a big celebration up there. We we're meeting other people. It was a spiritual event. And I was so excited. I just climbed up the mountain, 14,000 feet above sea level. Never thought for a second about how high it was. They drive you most of the way up. I didn't climb. I'm not that good. <laughs> you know, They drive you most of the way up and you walk up to the peak. But it's a little treacherous. Trust me. Um, and then I came back down and then it hit me. We got back to the hotel room and I said, Dave, I'm not afraid of heights. My mom is. Mm. So for 50 years, I'm telling people I'm afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of anything that I did that. She did that. You know what I mean? I mean, she didn't mean to do it. It was her stuff. I internalized it and I made it my own. So there's so many of those things. That's a little thing, but there are big things that are dictating your life. I mean, who knows? Maybe I would have been an airline pilot. I don't know. But I crossed that right off the list because I was, I'm afraid of heights. That's, I set my limitations right there. And it was set for me by somebody else. So when you realize that, you can go to another side of your mind. Your conscious mind is connected to your awareness. Your awareness is the highest level of your consciousness. Why? Because you're aware. We're one of the few creatures that are aware that we're having a thought or having an emotion. And if you're aware of such, guess what? You can change it. You can determine how you want to feel or how you want to be. And your awareness is connected to a higher source. And you can call it God, you can call it your higher self, you can call it source, put any label you want on it. That's where you're connected. And when you stop listening to the ego and you cut that off and you go to your awareness to get your information, get your answers from there, you become limitless. There is the real you. And when I take somebody in my coaching practice and I show them the real them, there are, that's the biggest moment that they realize they're not their ego. And it's a huge revelation. You never have to go back to being that person because it was never you in the first place. You have a choice. Just like Eckhart Tolle, Eckhart Tolle calls it the awareness. If you're aware, you can make changes. That's why it's labeled that. And that connection that we have with the divine or with 
source, whatever name you want to use, is so powerful. And if you ever watch Eckert, Eckert speak, there's long pauses in his answers. And that's because he's getting information from source. He's not digging it out of his subconscious and regurgitating something to you. He's getting it directly. And when you learn how to do that, you will change your whole existence. I promise you. Very good. That was really, really good. Now, number seven. And also I want to let you know, we may have to do this in two parts because <laughs> that's quite all right. I understand. <laughs> I'm just letting you know, I have another, I have another meeting to go to, no worries. Uh, but I, I love the answers and I don't want to cut you short, but I'm just letting you know, we may have to split this in two broadcast, Absolutely. but I also don't want you to cut yourself off because the answers that you're, you're giving are so thorough and, and the information so important. So just letting you know ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, because we're kind of like hovering in the middle, but I just wanted you to know. All right, number seven. <clears throat> How do you translate the complex concepts of metaphysics into actionable steps for personal growth in your coaching practice? Okay, so um, aside from, um, well, let's move away from the one I just gave you, and I'll give you something else. Um, let's see, I have something uh, called uh, the, the, the laws of attainment. There are four laws of attainment that I, that I have, uh, come to realize and, uh, they are, I'll, I'll give them to you real quick. Uh, law number one is thoughts or things. Law number two is to always maintain the attitude of gratitude. Three is you must visualize to materialize. And number four is take action. Those are the four laws of attainment. If you follow the four laws, you will be able to receive whatever it is in life that you're looking for. And this relates directly to the law of attraction that's been very popular lately. And it's uh, there's a movie's made about it called The Secret. And, um, you know, I love the movie, but there's just a little bit more to it. I think yeah. she could have gone more in depth. And I go more in depth. The first thing that you have to understand is thoughts are things and they travel on a frequency. And I, we kind of touched on that with quantum entanglement. And it's very similar, the law of attraction, how it works with quantum entanglement. So when two frequencies come together and they are the, a match, they are the same, um, they attract and they lock together. So if your thoughts are on a frequency and we already know that they are, we can send out a thought, it finds its match and the match will come to us. Um, it's, it's, again, it's no different than a radio works satellite. Uh, you know, when you remember the old fashioned radios, when you had to tune in the dial and if you were off just a little bit, you got static and you couldn't hear your favorite song. Yeah. But I'm old enough it, to remember that. Yeah. Right. And if you had it on, you were on and you got your song. So it works the same way. You've got to be on the same frequency. And I teach people how to get on the frequency of the thing that they want, because you can get on a frequency of say money or, or love or whatever it is that you seek and what you're looking for. Now, law number two is maintain the attitude of gratitude. Uh, you've got to be thankful for the things you already have or you're not getting anymore. Okay. So this sets the tone waking up. You asked me the question first thing, what are you grateful for? If I don't start my day being thankful for the things I got, why would I be getting any more? You know, why it, it just, it, it doesn't make sense. You've got to enjoy, you've got to stop and smell the roses. You've got to be content with what you already have. Um, and, and I believe that, that that's imperative for growth and happiness and many other things, but let's stick to the, the, the law of attraction here. Number three is visualize to materialize. Visualization is the way we turn words into a frequency. So when you visualize something, I tell people, don't just, visualization is really not the right term. You, when we visualize, you have to use all your senses and bring it up into the sixth sense, bring it up into your consciousness. That is your sixth sense. And yeah, you really do have a six. Everybody does. So you use all six. Let's say you're trying to get a new job. Um, picture yourself in your office. What does it smell like? Touch your desk. What does it feel like? Is there food in the conference room? What does that taste like? Use all your senses in your visualization practice 
So because, again, the universe does not speak English, French, Spanish, Japanese, or whatever else you speak, you've got to adjust to the universe. It's not going to adjust to you. <laughs> I am not. I am not Ray. I am called Ray. I don't know what a Ray is. I'm called that. If you say that sound, I turn and I look at you, but it has no meaning. And the universe doesn't say I'm Ray. You know what I mean? So that's something we made that stuff up. And you have to remember, we made that up, up just like time. There's no translation of time, but we can, we can do that another time. So anyway, visualize to materialize, do your best at really recreating the item that it is that you want. Okay. Last one, take action. Um, if you do all these steps and you just uh, stay on your couch and watch Netflix, it's not happening. Okay. It, it, you, you've got to go out and stimulate whatever it is that you're looking for. You don't have to be specific about it in order to get that particular item. But what you do have to do is something. You've got to interact with other people. Um, you know, again, it doesn't have to be specific to getting the job, but it's better if it is. But if it's not, that's just fine. Just do something. Get out of the house because you know what's going to happen. You're going to run into somebody that can open a door for you, or you're going to speak to somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Uh, but because you're you're putting these vibes out, you're putting these vibrations out, and now you want them to touch other as many other people as you possibly can touch with them, so that they can it resonates and they can say, "Oh, wait, I know somebody who works there. Let me make a phone call for you." And mm -hmm. boom, next thing you know, you've got it. You've got a hookup like that, and that's how this works laws of attainment that did i answer your question i, I, you, I, mean, thoroughly, I <laughs> you thoroughly answered it and you answered it in a very complete way and you answered it in a way that because i've been i get annoyed with the secret movie because yeah. i know it's not teaching everything yeah but i i could say that for a lot of situations that i won't go into right now so i really loved how thorough you were uh, well, with in, in her defense, she only has two hours to put stuff into a movie, right? It would have to be like an eight-hour movie. I to... could have used a little bit less some of the other people talking. We could have just that's me. <laughs> Fair that's, enough. That's, that's me, though. That's me. Yeah. Um, I was also in a weird place at the time. I was in rehab when I saw that movie. Oh. And, uh, and so that's another conversation. Anyway, what an ironic place to see it. It really... It really was. It really was. And I, again, I won't go into that story right now because this is your broadcast. All right. As a metaphysicist, yes. what's one experiment or finding that you find endlessly fascinating? Oh, endlessly fascinating. <laughs> My God, there's so many. Um, I mean, the law of attraction is definitely right up there. Because when, when you think about the law of attraction, it's not only applied to like one specific thing. Like a lot of people think it's like, oh, I want to have a million dollars. Why a million dollars? Why a million dollars? You know, think about the, your whole, your life as a whole. How do you want to shape that? How do you want to recreate that? Um, the techniques of retraining and reprogramming the mind in order to say the things that you want to have in a positive manner um, so that you achieve them is something that I use every day, all day, and try to get everybody else to do it because you, here's, here's the thing, you're a co-creator of this universe, okay? Yeah. Jesus told us, and this, he hit this right on the head, boy, you are part of God, God is a part of you. And you know what? There's, you can look for something similar in every single religion, regardless of who said it. You're a part of God, God's a part of you. And if you don't like the term God, that's fine. Change it up to universe, make it whatever you want change it to a scientific term. The bottom line is you're one with the source of all things. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that the power that you have, you can just, you can literally almost do anything. Can we move a mountain? No, not yet anyway, but you can attract things to you. You can make things happen. You can create a better life. And, you know, um, I know that we're short on time, but I could go on and on and on and on. I love the 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 law of attraction and i love the fact that we are co-creators of our own reality i i do too and i just to give you we're going to go 30 minutes so we're going to go 30 more minutes and then just go so however far we get and we'll continue uh because again I, I i don't want you to cut off your answers like okay. i want you to i want you to share everything that comes through you and don't worry about the time because we, we're going to do part two okay. um, 
All right. Can you share a success story from your coaching that illustrates the power of integrating metaphysics and transpersonal psychotherapy? Okay. Yes, I can. And th there's instantly one that comes to mind. And again, it goes to manifestation. I have a meditation that I teach folks and um, we do it twice a day. And the reason we do it twice a day is morning and night because when uh, it's easiest for us to get into a theta state right before we're falling asleep or right when we're waking up. And it's kind of um, really important to get into a theta state as you're doing this. Um, okay. So a woman came to me and, you know, we were going through uh, um, her process and what she wanted to come to fruition. And so I said, okay, let's, if you don't mind sharing them, because I normally tell people don't share them with just anybody because somebody else can maybe in the back of their mind not want you to have it. They have jealousy. They have these negative feelings. So I tell people don't tell anybody your manifestations. Okay. Keep that, you know, inside. But she shared it with me because I'm her coach. So I said, okay, so let's put three things. You know, what are your things? She said there were three. I didn't say there were three. She said, um, okay, so first is I want a book deal because I have a book in, uh, that I'm writing. I said, okay. And the second thing is I need $100,000. I said, okay, and let's put that there. Um, and what was her third thing? Her third thing was, um, oh, gosh, I can't remember the third thing. If it comes to me, I'll, 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 I'll remind myself. Those are, those are two. And I said, okay, so when do you need this? She goes, 90 days. I said, okay, let's do it. So twice a day. You're going to use this meditation in the morning. You're going to use this meditation at night. And in between, you're going to use what we've already gone over, which is the retraining process. So every time you think of these things, you're going to think of them in a positive state of mind where you are saying the words and having the thoughts that are creating the frequencies that are going to bring them to you. Got it? She's like, yeah, got it. Okay. Now she was, she was advanced when I met her. She was already, you know, knew a lot of things, which was, it definitely helped her. Because um, the first week, uh, we, we had our session one week later, and I said, so how did everything go? And she goes, well, you're not going to believe this, but I went to a lunch, and a friend invited me to lunch, and I really didn't feel like going. But for some reason, I just got up, and I went, meaning you took action. Okay, yep. So I went, and I sat there, and the person sitting next to me worked for Simon & Schuster. And I was like, really? She took my book. Really? Let me know how it goes. Whoa check one okay so that book is still in the works of becoming uh published um the sec the second week she gets back to me and she's i said how how are things going how's how's the book coming along she said really good we've had a lot of meetings and she told me what i need to change and what i need to do and, and all this other stuff and i was like excellent good for you she goes but i really had a tough week and i was like why and you know she starts telling me about the tough week and she goes, oh, but this happened. And I said, what's that? She goes, my financial advisor called me. And remember, I sold my house. And I put the money in, uh, you know, and, and I needed to um, make some money. And I, I said, yeah, you said something about 100000 She goes, yeah, well, he called me up and he was really bragging because he was like, I made you $110,000 this quarter. You know that, right? And I was like, that's, that's, that was your manifest. She's like, oh, yeah. And I was like, two down and i can't remember what the third one was but it did happen it took more weeks but it definitely did come to fruition so i ask her whenever she's available to like come on a podcast with me and you just got to tell your story because hers is phenomenal i mean it's really good i have some good ones too but uh that one hers is just incredible she's so you can just feel her energy you can feel it flow you know she has that and when you learn that the, these laws they, they just come easy for you. They really do. That's interesting. I, so I get visions. Um, I see when I talk to people or I'm working with a brand, I see what's possible and I see the strategic plan to get there. But then I also get the visions of what's to come for everyone else. And I've had those since I was a child. Mm. Ironically, though, I can't, I know I'm going to be careful how I use the words. I have struggled in the past, up until even last night, <laughs> the past, mm -hmm. trying to visualize by myself without falling asleep, without getting distracted. I, to this date, my visualization has come out of my control. 
Yeah. It just happens. Yeah. That's pretty I've never, How can you tell me, and this is not one of the questions, but I know there's other people like that. Can you speak to that at all? A little bit. I mean, you can um, induce it a little to a degree, but a lot of times it doesn't happen in the moment. And that's what kind of gives, um, I hate the word psychic. Let's use intuitive, okay? Sure. Uh, because psychic has been, uh, you know, just associated with fraudulent activities. We have an intuition. We know that. We have a gut feeling. We know that, right? Okay. So that can evolve into having visions or getting downloads, sometimes I call them. And it's just, uh, you know, a huge thought that just comes into your mind and you just know it's legit. You know it's real because you feel it where? In your gut. That's where the title came from. So, there are ways to induce them, but it's not always that you're going to get them right then and there. There are times that it works and there's times that it simply doesn't. And more often than not, it comes later. And, you know, I, and I tell people that if, you know, um, I don't really practice this uh, on a regular basis. It's not, I'm more involved in teaching people how to have their awakenings but I can do these things. And so every now and then I'll get a question and I'll, you know, I'll say, okay, you know, give me what I need and I'll let you know what I get when I get it. And if you let me do it like that, eventually it'll come. But if you need it right then and there on the spot, sometimes yes, sometimes no, it's more difficult. So I, like you, I'm still working on trying to make it happen when I want it to happen, not when it comes but we have to put it out there to get it in the first place, right? So we got to put that question out, put that thought out. Um, but there, it, it, I noticed that, and a lot of times people get disappointed. Like I was in my meditation and I thought I was going to, you know, receive it and, and, and everything. And it did, just didn't happen. And I said, well, just give it time, give it time. And even, even my wife will say that. And, um, and then I remember one time she's going to kill me for telling this story. Uh, she's in the bathroom. <laughs> literally going to the bathroom on the ball and she goes i got it and i said you got what and she said i figured out how we're gonna do the studio we're gonna do because we're opening a yoga studio she got the whole thing while she's on the toilet bowl and it was she was you know trying to manifest this for weeks and how, what it was going to look like how it was going to come to fruition and everything else and bam that's when it hit her and it was just funny so it, was, it became like an ongoing joke for us that that was the moment when she received the download wow that is so neat. I'm going to learn. I wish I could do it. Of course, it would be like a party trick. You know, for some reason, when I used to drink, I haven't, I'm not a drinker anymore, but um, when I would go out and I would start drinking, it would happen all the time. Like, in, like it was like a magic trick. Mm. And the weirdest thing, and I, which made me go, well, I guess God's okay with me drinking. And then I would end up going to jail and I'm like, okay, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Not so I've, much. Never, I've never understood that phenomenon. I don't, I would, I never got it from cannabis or anything else, unless if I had been up for multiple days, but alcohol for some reason, mm. I don't know. I, I can't explain that, but there's, that's something I want to understand, except I want to understand it through not drinking anymore because I didn't like what alcohol did for me, but it is interesting. Like why it would happen then. Maybe there's some correlation to what you were saying about the theta state. Does alcohol put you in theta state? No, in fact, alcohol, any substance is going to uh, make it more difficult for you to get in on the frequency that you want to get because it, well, it, let me say this every substance will put you on a different frequency, right? Sure. And if you learn how to get to a specific frequency sober, right? And you try to do it after you take something, it's not going to work because you have to fight the substance. So I always tell people, don't do this if you have a, had a drink or, or smoked or whatever, because it's going to mess with your vibrations and you can't overtake that. It's physical you put something in your body that's going to regulate your body and it's not going to happen until it wears off and it may be more than that depending on the half-life of, of the product so um i am very very specific do not use intoxicants and try this do it sober so um for whatever strange reason um maybe that was being given to you so that you would get sober i don't know but um i definitely think that um, you should avoid it. Oh yeah, I hundred percent agree. I mean, I I just I was I've never understood that phenomenon. But I also 
fully recognize that you know we're all we're all born with gifts like even if your heart is wicked oh, yes. and evil even oh, wicked yeah. and evil people have gifts and oh yeah you know and how you express those gifts um have a lot to do with your heart and so back then my heart was it was using my gifts for things that weren't necessarily so good that's right uh, the things now i want to use them for good right there's no judgment in the universe okay that's the thing that you know that's this is where i'm going to disagree with religion very very much there's no judgment there's no heaven and hell there's no good place bad place so you've got to do good things because you want to do them yeah because you want to stimulate positive karma and other positive things to come back to you it's not about a place that you're going to go because that doesn't really happen and all the bad guys and good guys go to the same spot it was invented um, it, by yeah, the was catholic invented. church they invented yeah. hell and i yeah. and i don't want to bash anyone's religion but like even like the way that we celebrate christmas that didn't even start till 150 years ago like at the and I'm going to go on a rant and I don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> let's go to the next question. Okay. Um, what's a common myth about metaphysics that you enjoy debunking in your teachings? Mm, it would have to be something where I'm bringing together science and spirituality. Um, but there's quite a few things. I love talking about quantum entanglement and how that works. Um, Hmm. I think that there's the overall um, metaphysical belief, if you will, or metaphysical concept that we are determining our reality. We are determining the rest of our lives. And it's almost easy to see if you look back at what you've done and really put some thought into this now i wrote a book to do this but i'm not saying you have to write a book but if you really go into detail into your past about the things that you did start to think about why that you did them what is the trigger that got you there right you start to see how you created that future when it when it was the future it's a past now but that you see how you created it and if you can do it to put yourself in a terrible place well guess what you can do it to put yourself in a great place and i think that i don't know if that really answers the question but i love the fact that you know and i tell people boy <laughs> religious folks are gonna hate us you are god okay you are part of god god is a part of you you are one with not separate from you're not less than you're equal to and we all are and collectively our collective consciousness that is the higher power that is the source of all and you know collectively we can do anything absolutely anything individually we're limited but we can shape our own lives and we can make our lives better and then we can attract other people that want to make their lives better and then we can teach them how to do it and they can teach people how to do it and that's how we're going to get the collective to override the negativity and the bad things in the world i hope oh it's happening it's happening it, the i i the reason why i know i know it's happening is because i see what happens in third world countries in the global south as they call it and uh i'm a part of several ecosystems and again i won't expand on this too much but the meek as they say are inheriting the earth and good things are starting to happen for the underserved populations of this world and and truth is coming out i mean every day it's like they it can't be contained and with that becomes an awakening for each individual that may not have been awake before that that's is so true. Uh, yeah, you're right on point. The worst, the, the things that are terrible that are happening to people are the things that are going to wake them. Um, when, like I said earlier, when things go easy for you and you've got everything, you learn nothing. Okay? But there are some people that I've, I have clients that are overseas, they're in other countries, they're in war countries, and they wake up grateful that they have half a family left because the other half was blown up. They don't wake up and say, I hate 
God, I hate everybody. They wake up grateful for the half that they have. I don't know if I could do that. It's, yeah, yeah. It's I, are the people that are going to take, that are going to run things. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And people talk about being good stewards, um, getting to work in media the way that I do, especially with education and other things. I get to see like what people from these countries, developing countries do to try to mimic what we have in America. And so they don't have all the tools and all the resources we have, but they improvise and to see what they do for like musicians and dancers and like what they do for instruments, what they do for microphones even, and, and how they put on performances and make their movies. And I mean, like I'm somebody that I've prided myself on being a good steward and doing the best I can with what I have as I build what God has put on my heart to build. Yeah. And then I still get frustrated because I don't have an, what I everything I want yet and that I can foresee that I need and to do what I'm going to do, but I know that that's coming. And there's a, as I'm getting frustrated, I'll have a video show up and I'll get to watch it. And it's you know people that have put taken trash and turned it into a full orchestra and they're mm. performing and I'm going, what is wrong with me? Right. Like, how am I not being like, I think I'm grateful about everything. And then I meet somebody that shows real gratitude. And I'm like, wow, wow. I need a heart check right now. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. excellent. excellent. All right. Let's go to the next question. How do you approach a new coaching client who is completely new to the concepts of metaphysics and spirituality? Well, uh, we ease them in by going through, I always go through psychology first. Um, much of the things that I teach are combined efforts of other, many other people's works. And the primary, the first, not primary, but the first two are, you know, are Freud and Young. Right, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, they are the basis of all psychology that we have today. And I, of course, in metaphysics, we gravitate more to, towards Jung than we do Freud, but they are both uh, extremely important. And their concepts are very easy uh, for others to accept because they've already been accepted in the medical community. You know, not all of Jung's, of course, because he speaks of the collective consciousness, things of like that. So, um, but the majority of them have, right? You can't go to college for psychology and not learn about those two, right? Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, go to the next level and we bring them to people like Eckerd and Joe Dispenza um, and perhaps Deepak Chopra and their teachings. And now we're going, we're, we're kind of expanding on that a little bit more. And then we can start going into Bruce Lipton, Dean Radin. These guys are proving that science and spirituality are one in the same. And it's a step-by-step -step process. But the first thing that everybody wants to know is just how can I make my life better? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is look at what's not working for you, which is probably the rep repetitive nature of the past, which is the ego telling you what to do. Let's start by getting rid of that and give you some freedom and turn that you know obsessive narrator in your head off to the best of our ability and there's so much relief there and when they notice that their awareness is begins to guide them their higher selves they start to do things they never knew that they could do before and that is the first step and then the other things come easily mm, very good now, this is going to be the last question we ask for this round, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to have the final word and plug everything because I'm going to publish round one okay. um, and then publish again for round two. Sure. But the last question I'm going to ask this, this round, mm -hmm. what's the most unexpected question a reader has ever asked you about your books and how did you respond? Ooh, wow. Um the most unexpected question. That's a tough one. Um, I'm, I'm not 100% certain I have one in particular. 
I want to. Okay, let me. How about, I'm going to ask you this question then. I, okay, I have because something this a little is actually burning in my brain, and I want to know. Okay, where do you feel like the common ground? And I know some religions tie in science, but there is a separation. I personally think the separation was done intentionally. Yeah to cause confusion and to keep us divided as humans from knowing the truth of who we really are. But that's my take. But what do you feel like the common ground is for science, you know, and the, what some term is new age thinking and then religious thinking and then Christianity, which try to tries to separate itself from religion, even though it's still part of religion. Yeah. Where's the common ground for all of those different groups to meet in the middle? the actual teachings of Jesus the way they were meant to be delivered. <laughs> say that and again. Hold on. I, I laughed and clapped over you. Please say that again because it was the awesome. actual teachings of Jesus. If you listen to Eckhart Tolle, he will explain what was... It, the man speaks like 13 languages, okay? He's absolutely brilliant. And his uh, way of uh, explaining what the terms that Jesus was using actually meant to jesus when he said it heaven is not a place that we go when we die he said it's a state of mind that you can achieve right here right now so there's so many misconceptions if you study jesus and the buddha the way they both spoke in their language at their time and decipher what they actually wanted you to learn all your answers are right there a hundred and ninety percent accurate because I read a book called Jesus and the Buddha, and it puts their saying side by side. Oh, I gotta write that down. It's right. it's wonderful. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. And it does make some people mad, but I'm like, how are you gonna be mad when that's what they said? Like, you know, yeah. you want to say that one's going to hell, but they're teaching the same thing. This is and then if you factor in the Gospel of Thomas, which some people say, well, that's not anointed or whatever. It's not part of the canon or whatever that bullcrap saying is. Who said that, man? Did man say that? Oh, they voted on it? Okay. Do you not remember how the uh, the other elections in this world have gone? Anyway, that's another conversation. But when you read the Gospel of Thomas and like really sit and try to understand what Jesus is saying in those sayings, as they call it, yeah. and then you go look at what he says in the Bible, they absolutely complement each other. But the difference is the gospel of Thomas is more about self-mastery, self-control. Yeah. And it, but it's again aligns exactly with what Jesus teaches in the Bible that most people read, even though throughout the world they read different Bibles, which is another conversation. Yeah. So yeah right, right, right. I absolutely I love this so much. Um, I I wish that we could just go for hours, but I do have other commitments. I I I, I can't wait to have you back for round two. I'm gonna send you my calendar back. This was so good. Um, it was worth the wait because we've been waiting for like two weeks to do this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to give you the last word. Please share what's on your heart, but also make sure you plug your books and where people can follow you to support you or find you to support you. Uh, well, thank you for allowing me to say that. Um, my website is raycatania.com or limitlesspublications.com. Um, the books are the first book I wrote was the atheist in the afterlife. And that is the story of me going from a uh, troubled background, uh, accepting atheism as, as a belief system, if you will, or, and coming to terms with the fact that there is an afterlife after the NDE and so on and so forth. And many of the things it's uh, the thing about the book is it's a story. It's a story book. It's a, it's, um, it's not a how-to book. It's it's a it's a story of my life, and I take you through the processes, and I take you through what happened to me in order for you to see what I saw. So it's like I'm taking the reader on a journey, and I did that with the second book, and for probably the first half until the second half, I started to get into. I really wanted people to get the th the 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 things that I learned that were very specific in my transformation. Um, because they were very specific and it's not complicated. Like I'm not a genius. I'm not brilliant. <laughs> I'm just a regular guy. Um, and, and if I can do this, anybody can do this. 
The second book is You Are Still Alive, Now Act Like It. Um, and um, um, so as far as, you know, my stuff, that's really what I uh, would plug. Well, I'm uncomfortable when I talk about my own stuff. Uh, but, <laughs> but I try to answer every email. And um, if I can do DMs, I do them whenever I can. I'll, I do my best to answer everything. So it might take me a little bit. Um, and I just want to say, uh, Joshua, uh, you know, I really appreciate you and having me and allowing me to answer these questions. Um, and uh, I would love to speak with any of your viewers. Just go to the website and, and I, I look forward to doing this with you again. I think you're a special person. I appreciate you. Thank you.